Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're speaking with Medea Benjamin, who needs no introduction for most of you, a founder and leader for many years of Code Pink, Women for Peace, a peace activist extraordinaire, and for purposes of this show, the author, among numerous wonderful books, of Uh, a co-author with Nicholas Davies of War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. Medea Benjamin, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Nice to be on with you, David. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am very, very tired of repeating the most relevant facts about this war over and over again that never will make it onto corporate media. Uh, And I think the very best collection of them uh, is this book. People should get this book and read it. Uh, So if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what we do with this book and what we do as activists and and what strategies might work to finally end this war. Does that sound good? That sounds great. If people haven't got the book, I do hate to plug Amazon because we know what a horrific model it is, but we do need some people to buy it from Amazon so they can put up a review uh, before others uh, are starting to put up their negative reviews. So um, that's one plug. Uh, But yes, I'd love to talk about what we can do, because I think no matter where people stand on how much you're going to blame NATO expansion, how much you're going to blame U.S. interference in the internal affairs of Ukraine in 2014, how much are you going to blame the uh, the inability to implement the Minsk Accords? We are where we are, and we're going to have to find out how to solve this problem And that's where I think we as activists are totally deficient and need to come up with some creative ideas. But uh, isn't there a problem with wanting peace if that involves compromise when complete victory and unconditional surrender by the bad side of the war uh, is is just moments away. And, and if you haven't learned that by now, you've been hearing it for months and months. It's been moments away. Uh, so shouldn't we, you know, what do you, what do you say to people who demand complete and total victory and shun the very idea of any sort of compromise? Well, now we don't have to quote ourselves or history. We can actually talk about the, uh, the number one a military advisor to President Biden, the chair of the Joint Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, and say what he has been saying on national television and in public addresses, which is, Ukraine, you fought a great resistance to the Russian invaders. Uh, now it looks like it's pretty much a stalemate. Winter is coming. Isn't this a great time to seize the moment and sit down at the negotiating table? So. I think that is a perfectly rational argument. Unfortunately, it's not the argument you hear from others in the Biden administration, including President Biden himself, or including the head of our Secretary of State, our Department of State, Anthony Blinken, who you know, David, is supposed to be our number one diplomat in this country, and yet you haven't heard a diplomatic word out of his mouth. Uh, since the beginning of this war. And it's certainly a shameful thing that he hasn't been taking the charge to talk to his counterparts in Russia, to meet with his counterparts in Europe and figure out how are we going to uh, sit down at the negotiating table. He's done nothing of that sort. So uh, we need to now go to the people in the Pentagon uh, to hear a rational explanation of why this war will not be won on the battlefield, why it's not a good idea to be, quote, supporting Ukraine until complete victory, uh, and uh, why we have to push to get other people in Congress and the administration to take the same line that Mark Milley has taken. Absolutely. Uh, I I do think there is a certain logic to the idea that if Russia gets what it wants out of this war, that's horrible news for future war making. 
But I also think if NATO gets what it wants out of this war, that's horrible news for future war making. Don't we don't we actually need no victory for anybody? Isn't that the, the only outcome that 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 augurs well for the future of humanity? Russia's not going to get what it wants if you think that the reason it came in from three different directions and went to the capital was because they thought it would be a pushover to take over uh, the government of Ukraine. Well, that obviously didn't happen. And they have been pushed out of other areas that they took over. And they have been uh, getting a, a lot of pushback from countries around the world for continuing this uh, invasion. And when they called up 300,000 more reserves, um, they're getting a lot of pushback internally. So Russia's not getting or Putin is not getting what he wanted out of this war. And when you sit down at the negotiating table, uh, he'll get even less. But Ukrainians are certainly not going to get what Zelensky is now calling for, which is not what he called for earlier, uh, and now calling for uh, getting Russia out of every single inch of territory in Donbass and, and uh, Crimea itself. Uh, but as you know, David, when uh, peace talks happen, compromises are made, and compromises have to be made to end this war. And I don't think we can determine where that line in Donbass is going to be drawn or uh, how there will be internationally supervised referendums so that the people in Crimea and Donbass uh, are able to be the ones to decide their own future. Um, but that can be worked out at the negotiating table as long as there is a, an emphasis that talks need to happen, that the U.S. will not be giving a blank check to Ukraine, uh, that the U.S. will not be sending in billions of dollars every month to keep the economy going. Uh, that Those are signals uh, that mean that it's time to compromise. And I think it's um, Im important uh, to start sending those signals. As the chairman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff speaking a little common sense and saying something that smart people like yourself had been saying for months, uh, opened up uh, the media in any way? Is it now possible to say things uh, in the U.S. corporate media that it wasn't before? Because my impression is that that hasn't really changed. Absolutely. I don't think anything has changed in the corporate media. Uh, I think they uh, reported on what Millie said, but they didn't change the way that they are reporting on what's happening in Ukraine or giving space to people like us uh, who have been uh, writing op-eds and submitting them to papers and trying to get on a corporate television and can't get our voices out there. So I think it's quite remarkable that even with this barrage of um, uh, uh, corporate media uh, point of view that there is winning in Ukraine, uh, that the polls are showing that people's opinions are changing. And if you look at polls that were took place in March and compare them to November, uh, certainly among those who identify as Republicans, you now have most of them saying that the U.S. is doing too much to support Ukraine. Uh, and you have uh, an increase also from the Democratic side as well. So the base is starting to say, I don't see where this is going. I don't understand why we're giving uh, before the end of the year what will look like over $100 billion to this war when we have so many needs at home. But that has to trickle up to those who keep approving this massive amount of money for Ukraine. Medea Benjamin, you mentioned Republicans. Uh, we heard from some of them before the recent election, and we certainly hear from Democrats to this day that if Republicans get any power in Congress, they will end the war because they are evil opponents of democracy and slaves of Vladimir Putin and Russia lovers. Uh, that'd be wonderful if they would, even if it was for cockamamie, <laughs> horrible reasons, it would be wonderful if they would. But I, I never thought they really would. Uh, will they? Can we make them? Well, I think we have to understand, and we can see it in the votes that have happened, that the majority of Republicans, and so far every single one of the Democrats, have been in favor of 
the blank check for Ukraine. But there are those 57 that said no the last time in the House, 11 of them in the Senate. And I actually think there will be more of them in the votes to come. Now, Kevin McCarthy, who is going to take Nancy Pelosi's place as Speaker of the House, came out and said there won't be a blank check. And then he got all kinds of pushback from the Hawks within the party. And he said, well, it doesn't mean we're not going to support Ukraine. It just means that we want to audit where all those weapons are going and uh, where all that money going into the uh, Ukrainian economy is ending up. Uh, So he is starting to walk back what he said. But I think there is this base, both among people who would identify as um, extreme, maybe uh, people who identify as Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever, um, there are people among the American public who are saying that this is not a good thing for us. They're seeing the inflation in the grocery store at the gas pump and in their uh, energy bills, and they're connecting that at least in part to what is happening in Ukraine. So I think there'll be more pressure on Republicans. And not that I am a fan of Donald Trump, but the fact that Donald Trump keeps talking about this war, both in his acceptance, in his uh, uh, speech where he said that he was going to run for president, as well as in his uh, uh, rallies, he talks about the war being disastrous, that it could lead to a nuclear war, that we've got to sit down at the table, and that if he were in power, he would be talking to Putin and ending this war. He says those kind of things because he knows it resonates with people. So I think if we can do more to organize the voices of ordinary people trying to talk sense into the Democrats and Republicans, I think we will hear Uh, We will have more of a debate in Congress. We'll have hearings in Congress. And eventually, uh, this could lead to an indication to the White House that there will not be the the, uh, same kind of receptiveness to these endless checks as there has been with the Democrats controlling the Congress. We're speaking with Medea Benjamin about her new book with with Nicholas Davies called War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. And I highly recommend it. Um, Medea, to the extent that we can get anyone to listen to the crazy notion that there should be a ceasefire and negotiations, is there any use to be made of the holiday season of demand for a truce around holidays? Uh, it, what can we be be pushing immediately on on Republicans and Democrats alike? Well, I'm very excited that there are two very similar in- initiatives, one by uh, you all at World Beyond War and the International Peace Bureau calling for this Christmas truce and one initiated by my organization, Code Pink, and the Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, calling for the same thing, both hearkening back to that very inspirational moment in World War I in 1914 when the soldiers put down their guns and started fraternizing and playing football together and sharing meals and singing Christmas carols and showing that we are all human beings and shouldn't kill each other. Uh, we... Uh, when we put forward our um, uh, statement about people of faith uh, calling for this Christmas truce, we tried, we, our idea was to get a hundred uh, leaders in the faith-based community to make the call and then take that to the head of the faith-based initiatives in the White House. And within a week, we have now over 500 leaders from the head of the Um, the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Barber, Reverend Jesse Jackson, people from the National Council of Churches, from heads of Muslim organizations, Jewish organizations. And it's been so exciting to see all of these different denominational leaders coming together for this. And I think it is an important show that war is too um, um, important an issue to leave to partisan politics and those who have legitimacy when it comes to moral values are speaking up to say enough of the killing. So that's an exciting initiative that is coming together in the next couple of weeks. 
Uh, and we hope to be doing others like this, where we get different sectors of our society uh, to come together uh, in a very um, strong way and to call for meetings in the White House, not just to deliver the petition, but to actually get a chance to talk to representatives in the White House. One of the responses, as you know, that you get out of the White House is, well, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. It's up to the people of Ukraine to decide what we deprive our great grandchildren of in terms of massive resources we dump into a war that's destroying the people of Ukraine. Uh, at the same time that as readers of your book will understand, the United States has been going to great efforts to avoid peace, uh, telling Ukraine what to do and then claiming to be obeying what, what Ukraine demands. Is there a way that we can break through that rather slick propaganda trick? Yes, I think it's important to people for people to realize that the U.S. and the U.K. came together to torpedo negotiations that were going on in March and April. Uh, but that despite that, Ukraine and Russia have been talking about certain specific issues successfully, whether it is uh, the grain deal to get over 10 million tons of grain out of that country uh, to people who need it all over the world, or whether it's the deal that was made to stop the shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear plant and get representatives from the International Atomic Energy Association into the, the plant, or whether it's the deals that are constantly being made to swap prisoners, um, that there are talks that have been happening. They have to move to the level of talks about how to end the war itself. And then on the other hand, it's been so interesting, David, to see that while Biden and, and Blinken have not been talking to their counterparts in Russia, that there are people in the U.S. administration that have been talking to their counterparts, and that is the head of the, uh, the CIA, the head of the Defense Department, and the head of the National Security Council. And they've been talking about uh, one very critical thing is how do we stop this war from spreading? How do we stop it from going into a nuclear war? How do we stop it from uh, getting the U.S. and NATO directly involved in this war? So we know that people in the administration are very concerned about that. And when we had that incident where the missile uh, killed two people in Poland, many of us thought, uh-oh, this is the moment we've been worried about. Uh, luckily, that particular missile did not come from Russia. It came from Ukraine. But where's the next one going to come from? And people in the administration understand that. And while they're willing to see this war go on to the last Ukrainian, they don't want any Europeans or people from the U.S., uh, any of the, the uh, NATO countries, uh, to get directly involved and have their soldiers killed in Ukraine. So um, the there is an incentive uh, to... Uh, move towards negotiations. And um, I think that with the examples of negotiations actually happening uh, on certain levels, um, it's now to extend it to the logical level. And, you know, there is this issue about the Christmas truce. There is the issue about the uh, winter months coming up. I think there's also another issue, and that is the environmental consequences of this war that it's important to talk about, especially when we want to get more people involved in calling for peace. And I find that when I talk to young people, uh, they are much more, uh, they perk up when you talk about the environmental consequences. And the fact that there was just the COP27 meeting where the uh, great victory was calling for a fund for losses and damages for the global south. Uh, where is the money for that fund going to come from? We see that the promises in the past to fund a similar global climate fund was never complied with. And yet here we have over $100 billion spent on this war in Ukraine. So there is a call from the global south to take this money we're spending on war and put it into addressing this existential threat on the environment. And that's something I think we have to go to, uh, to groups like Greenpeace and 350.org and the Sunrise Movement and all of these other groups that actually do have 
uh, a large number of young people that are involved and care about the future of the planet and connected to the issues of this war in Ukraine. I, I want to ask about that and several things you brought up. I, I, I want to ask about the the missile in Poland, uh, because it seems that everyone agreed it didn't come from Russia, except the president of Ukraine, uh, <laughs> who for quite some time did not agree with that. Now, does he answer more to the right wing in Ukraine than to Washington? Is he completely out of control? Is he on his own? I mean, there was a moment when Dr. Frankenstein's monster wasn't uh, serving Dr. Frankenstein anymore. Uh, what, what governs what Zelensky does? Well, one factor, I think, is that for Zelensky, uh, wouldn't it be grand if the U.S. and the NATO countries got directly involved to smash Russia? And uh, he seemed during that time of the missile uh, of that crisis in Poland uh, to feel like, aha, perhaps this is the moment we've been waiting for. We've been in, he has been calling for more and more uh, high-powered weapons in Ukraine. There's been a reluctance to send them. Uh, and he keeps pushing and then he keeps winning and getting more high powered weapons. And I think uh, in the end, what he would really like is the direct involvement. Uh, so, yes, at this point, he wants something different than what uh, uh, President Biden wants and even what NATO wants. So it was quite a moment to recognize uh, that there is not a 100 percent agreement in where this war should be going and who should be fighting it. And the fact that you had the Biden administration contradicting what Zelensky was saying uh, was an important show that as this moves forward, there is going to be more and more division, and especially in Europe, because really uh, Europeans are being uh, whiplash by the result of cutting off the energy from Russia. Their inflation is just skyrocketing. Uh, there are more demonstrations in Europe and people questioning their own governments. So I think the division in Europe is going to be much, much greater as this goes on. And it's not only within Europe, with the Balkan states and Poland being, being closer to Ukraine uh, than countries like Germany, France and Italy, but also a difference with the United States. And we're hearing now the complaints by uh, uh, um, the Europeans saying that the United States is profiting off of their uh, sanctions on Russian energy and that U.S. energy companies are coming in and selling them energies at, at four or five times the price that Americans are paying. And also that the U.S. is encouraging companies in Europe to come to the United States and put up their uh, manufacturing plants there because they can do it much cheaper with much cheaper energy. And so this is something that is uh, suddenly become a big difference uh, and a major complaint that the Europeans have with the United States strategy. Yeah, cheaper labor, too, and l more lax environmental regulations as well. But but so we've got a war being led. We've got about five minutes left, Medea, a, a, a war being led by someone who wants to escalate it, bring in more nations at the risk of global nuclear apocalypse. So you'd think we could get people with some interest in the continuation of life on Earth to be with us. You've got environmental destruction running rampant and, and uh, nations unable to cooperate because of the divisions created. You'd think we could get environmental advocates with us. Uh, you've got not just not just this blockade on global cooperation, but you've got uh, anyone who cares about poverty or anywhere else, the money should be going, should be with us. You've got the rule of law being destroyed. I, I mean, Every issue under the sun ought to be forming a grand coalition against this war. How do we get these these in other interest groups and other individuals uh, involved in recognizing the danger that that war in general and this war in particular are to the things they care about? Well, we're moving in that direction, David, and unfortunately, it's not fast enough, but um, we are stuck with the movement or lack of movements that we have at this time, and we have to find ways to really bring them together. That's why the faith-based initiative, the environmental issue, 
Uh, I'm part of Code Pink, a women's group. We should be gathering women's groups uh, all over the U.S. and and uh, globally uh, to make this a women's issue as well. Um, we have to think about left-right alliances. Uh, do we work with the people in the libertarian movement and those Republicans who are against this war? Um, do we come together to put the pressure on the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy? These are important issues that we all have to discuss and uh, come and and find answers to. And different people will come to different conclusions, and that's fine. They should organize within the sectors that they want to organize in. But the important thing now is not to keep uh, debating each other about uh, who is to blame. Uh, the important thing is to not keep debating each other about uh, how we are going to uh, reach, uh, how we're going to um, uh, put pressure on Putin because we really don't have the ability to do that. The important thing is how do we put pressure on those that we have access to? And while uh, so many people, and rightly so, are very cynical about the electoral system in this country, uh, those in power, those who vote to send this money, uh, are the ones that are supposed to be representing us. And the White House, you know, we have more access to the White House than we think. I've been surprised, David, at the number of times we've actually made calls to different sectors in the White House and actually gotten responses and gotten meetings in the State Department. So we have to use that power and we have to encourage people who have uh, more access perhaps than we do uh, to use that power uh, and push in all of those sectors. So I feel like there's endless work to be done and more people have to get involved in doing that work. We're speaking with Medea Benjamin. Medea, we have about a minute left. The book is War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. You're doing a book tour. You're doing events. How can people keep track of you, keep up with you, join in, uh, follow along? Well, two ways. One is they can join the peaceinukraine.org coalition. It's open to individuals and organizations. We meet every two weeks, and we'd love to have your ideas and your enthusiasm. And the other is codepink.org, and the book tour is there with the places that I'm going. Please come and join me if it's a place near you. And if I'm not going your, to your city, just contact us, info at codepink.org, and send me an invitation, me or, or my co-author, Nicholas Davis. We'd love to come to your community. Medea does great events and seems to never tire of doing great events. Uh, Medea Benjamin, thank you for everything you've been doing for years and what you're doing now on Ukraine. Uh, the book, which I can't recommend highly enough by Medea Benjamin and Nicholas Davies, is War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. Medea, thank you once again for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Great to be on with you and great to be part of World Beyond War. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.